Welcome to For the Long Run, the podcast exploring the why behind what keeps runners running long, strong, and motivated. And just like that, we're live. I'm super stoked to share this first episode of the podcast with Coach Ben Rosario. Ben's the head coach of the Hoka Northern Arizona Elite Team, and I've been a big fan of Ben's work over the last few years and how he and the team always keeps it real, sharing the highest of highs and some of the lows that inevitably go along with uh, with any sort of training. Ben and the team are super open with it, and, and they're training, they go hard when it comes to recovery, and they train out of Flagstaff, Arizona. I sat down with him in person, and we talked about his background, and uh, we, we talked about his own training and racing, being a business owner, and the process-oriented approach that he and his team takes, and much, much more. I hope you enjoy. All right, I am here in Flagstaff, Arizona, with the coach, uh, with Coach Ben of uh, Hoka Northern Arizona Elite. Um, thanks for uh, taking some time here today, Ben. Yeah, glad to glad to be here. I, we're doing this kind of on a whim, which means it'll be a really uh, kind of fun conversation, I think. Yeah. So um, I am out here with Ben. We've been talking high performance. We've been talking elite sport and what it takes to compete. Uh, at the highest level, um, but let's let's hear first a little bit about yourself. How did you get into what got what got you excited about running uh, at the at the beginning? At the beginning, well, Back it's not beginning. not different than a lot of people. Um, I was fortunate enough to have um, a mentor, a teacher uh, that was into running when I was in grade school, and it is it was a different time. You know, I think there's so many more runners now. Um, this is their, you know, early nineties. And I uh, had a seventh and eighth grade math teacher who was a runner and was passionate about it and started a cross country meet in the fall for all the local, uh, grade schools. Uh, I went, I was, I grew up in St. Louis, the city of St. Louis. It was all the city Catholic grade schools there. And, um, yeah, he had, a, he had a meet at this little park and it was just two miles and we, we trained quote unquote for it every day after school for about six weeks. And we just training consisted of meeting outside in the parking lot and running around this mile loop in the neighborhood, you know, two or three times, basically as fast as you can every day. <laughs> Max and, effort always. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, I don't know what we were supposed to do, but that's basically <laughs> what we did. And, uh, you know, I just loved it. And then, I would say I was in heavy like with running after that and then head over heels in love once I got to high school because I was fortunate enough to go to a program uh, that was one of those, you know, 100 kids on the team, coach is great, coach is super passionate. And um, yeah, it was then it was like my whole life from there on. That's awesome. And so you mentioned uh, the running store in uh, St. Louis, right? Yeah, so that's a fast forward. So uh, after college, I ran for the Hanson's Brooks team in Michigan for two years. And it's tough going if you're not really good. I mean, I enjoyed it. Two great years in my life. Uh, but I did then um, move back to St. Louis, took a job with the St. Louis Marathon for one year. But a few months into that job, my good friend Matt Helbig and I decided to open a running store. This was 2005 uh, into 2006. And so almost every night after work, I would go over – well, I would work and then run and then go over to Matt's and we'd work till midnight uh, on the business plan. And by August of 06, we were open. So Big River Running Company opened in August of 06. We were both 26 years old. And it was a big success. I mean, we worked really hard, um, but it was the right time and the community was ready for us and we brought a lot of energy and we opened a second location in 08 and then a third location in 2010 and we were just rocking and rolling. That's awesome. And so they say that, you know, success helps you achieve more success, but failure also helps you achieve more success. So it's, you know, these little lessons that you learn uh, in those experiences, you know, help you help definitely helped you get to where you are today. So let's hear a little bit more about um, how did you get out to Flagstaff? What what brought you out here? Burnout brought me <laughs> out here. So I said we worked really hard. I'm not lying. Right. I mean, worked really hard. Uh, it was definitely a seven day a week, 52 week a year job. And I was plus overtime. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> lots of overtime. I mean, when you're when you're the owner, there's right. no such yeah, thing as overtime. All, yeah. uh, 
but that's fine. I mean, we had to do it that way, you know, and I was sort of the face of the company. I was the one that went out to all the group runs and, um, took care of our training team and, and coached our youth team and, um, spoke at various events about shoes and running and health and fitness. And so, you know, it was just a lot. And, and, and in 2012, my wife, Jen and I had, at that time, a one-year-old daughter, and um, I was just fried, you know, and I just got to the point where even though we were successful and there was no signs of anything slowing down, I just needed to slow down, yeah. you know, and so we we talked about where to move, and I had been out here in Flagstaff in 2007 training for the Olympic trials, and I really enjoyed the town, and we came out and visited. We liked it, and we just moved, kind of sight unseen almost. I mean, we had that one visit, but other than that, she had no experience out here, and uh, we just did it. Nice. So you mentioned the burnout. Um, we see it in we see it in life and the business world, but also in in sport. So how do you how do you take that personal experience of going at a hundred percent all the time to what you're doing today, and how do you how do you balance so that you have the energy to travel with the team and travel with your athletes, but also, you know, not drive yourself into that hole. Well, um, <clears throat> I don't know that I always do the best job, you know, to be honest. I mean, you're hardwired a certain way. Right. Um, I have tried to identify periods of time during the year that would be good to get away. Yep. I don't think I've probably done it as much as I should. The problem is, you know, everybody's always got something coming up right. because we're not a track team. It's not like we have a season, you know, that's just the spring and summer. Right. We, we're we doing stuff all year round. And so, you know, I never want to miss anything. But um, I don't know. I think I've done a little bit better job of, um, you know, uh, like I was just telling you before this podcast, actually, that it was a big high this weekend of the right. U.S. Cross Country Championships in Tallahassee. And that was a meet that we were really excited for and I was really excited for. And, and um, you know, both of the last couple of days here – I've kind of chilled out in the afternoon after practice and not really done any, any work. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, this is work sort of, right. but it's fun. And, um, you know, just try to recognize those feelings. Right. I, you can recognize right. them. I, I do do a better job of recognizing them and then trying to cut them off at the pass, um, and giving myself a little time to relax here and there. So I wouldn't say I've done a great job with big old long vacations, right. but at least just little things here and little there. Micro. Trying, yeah. Little micro things, yeah. um, for sure. And I, and I'll say this, the athletes, I, I, I'm better, I'm better at recognizing that they need time off, you know, so I'm really big on them taking time off after the end of their, uh, season, yep. especially after a big race, like a marathon, taking two weeks off. I don't need to see, I don't need to hear right. from you. You just take your time, do your thing. Um, because I want them to have long careers too. Totally. So one thing, um, you spoke with Mario Frioli on his podcast and I think what you said was, um, my professional athletes take the day after marathon off and, and they run for their job. So if there's, you know, if there's any benefit to running the day after a race, they'd be doing it. So do you want to talk a little bit more about the, um, the approach to recovery that, that the Hoka uh, Northern Arizona elite team takes and why it's different than some other approaches? Oh, well, I mean, I just, yeah, I mean, I've just been through it, you know, um, not only myself, but I've watched enough athletes go through it and, for whatever reason, the um, I don't know how uh, with the proper terminology is the regular runner, you right. know, uh, just does not seem to want to take a day off ever. Right. I think I said on Mario's podcast, my hypothesis is that most of those athletes got into running late. And they got into it and it was a huge turning point in their life mm -hmm. uh, for the better. And they're afraid that if they take a couple of weeks off, they'll go back to whoever they used to be, right. uh, which might might mean they were out of shape or right. they were depressed or whatever it might have been. Um, you know, so I understand that, that mindset, but the, the reality is, look, you're not going to be out of shape just because you take a week or two off after a big season. Um, and in fact, I would argue that that little bit of shape that you lose or that little bit of fitness that you lose is a good thing because it's really intoxicating to start getting fit again. Right. That's a really good feeling. And you can't have it if you constantly stay uh, here, meaning mm – -hmm medium fit, right. you know, you want to get really fit, but to get really fit, you also have to have periods where you relax and recover. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's, that's the best way I can explain it. Totally. So do your, do your athletes have regular rest days or is it, are they active recovery? What, what is, a um, not necessarily post-race, but what is, 
what is an easy day look like for a, for a professional? Well, it depends on the athlete, of course. Some can h- handle real high mileage and they can run seven days a week and none of the days need to be particularly easy. I mean, they're easy in terms of the effort level, right. but, but mileage-wise, they're all pretty high. Uh, and then others need a day off now and again. Um, I don't think we have anybody that takes a day off every week, but we do have athletes that take a day off every two or three weeks mm-hmm. um, or athletes that need a four mile day here and there. Uh, but most of their easy days are, you know, eight to 10 miles in the morning and probably four miles in the afternoon, you know, uh, but they do them at a pace that's very, you know, very easy aerobically. They can talk conversational pace, uh, especially at altitude. You can't really get away with running fast on your easy runs. You'll, it'll bury you for sure. Um, so one of the things that we were talking about before we started the podcast was the, the engagement or the, the sense of realness that, that the team takes. Um, how did you, how did you sort of foster that culture and how, how did you, how did you get the athletes to sort of buy into being so open? Well, we've always been honest with all of our athletes going in that this is part of what we do. This right. is part of our job or this is part of your job if, if you're going to be on this team. And that's okay if that's not what you're into, but right. then you're just – that's not the team not, for you. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Because we feel like to be a professional athlete in this sport anyway, you have to do more than just run because because of a lot of reasons. Um one of the easiest things to explain is that, look, we're just not out there in front of the public that often. You know, LeBron James plays 82 basketball games right. a year, and there's a press conference after each every and every one, one of them. You know, we race, I mean, depending on your event, you're racing less than 10 times a year as a distance runner. That's not enough. You know, so you've got to be out in front of your fans way more often. And the only way to do that um, is to be active on social media, to say yes to podcast interview requests. <laughs> Spur of the to, moment. <laughs> to say yes, to say yes to interview requests uh, from various magazines. It's just it's just putting yourself out there. Uh, and you you said you know in a real way. And yeah, that that's that's the that's the sell to the athletes is look, we're not asking you to be phony. In fact, right. I don't want you to be phony. Right. I just want you to be you. And I want you to take your time and figure out your voice and figure out who your fans are and speak to those fans, Definitely. you know, and, and you don't have to try to be everything to everyone. In fact, that's not a good don't, plan. Yeah. Uh, yeah, in fact, don't, <laughs> uh, but, but be who you are and, and your fan base will show itself over time and you'll figure out who's, who's following you and, and just be you, you know, and there's such great examples on the team. I'll I'll give a quick one. Scott Smith is a guy who didn't necessarily want to be involved in social media when he first joined uh, and hadn't, that hadn't been something that he was into, but he's a funny guy. He's a nice guy. He's kind of a quirky guy. He loves little Caesar's pizza. And he just started slowly just kind of putting out tweets that were him, you know, that were just things he found to be funny internally. And you know what happened? Other people, people found them it. funny yeah. too, you know, and, and he's built this kind of little niche following, um, and he's sort of got this kind of underdog feel to him. And, you know, he ran at UC Santa Barbara, which wasn't the biggest D1 school. And so he's got kind of this following that is really cool because they like him for who he mm-hmm. is. And, uh, he did that even though he didn't think he would like it. I think he likes it now. Nice. Yeah. So I got to know, is, is Scott Fobble always eating burritos? <laughs> Scott Fobble does eat a lot of burritos. <laughs> he does eat a lot. He doesn't maybe eat as many as you'd think he does based on his uh, social media. <laughs> He'll deny that. But uh, no, he, he, uh, he, he's, he's real honest too. You know, he's a funny guy, um, but he, he's, he loves the sport. He's intense uh, about racing and uh, – Certainly, the book Inside a Marathon, which I wrote with him uh, leading up to the New York City Marathon, is the best look into the mind of a professional runner that I've seen of late. Definitely, for sure. So, how did how did the book come about? The book was, you know, Steph Bruce is. Um, such a great uh, leader on our team. And she really thought that Scott should do something like this. And she had kind of been in his ear to do something like this. And I guess he, I guess she convinced him of it. And then he came to me before the segment started and, and had the idea to do it with me. Um, sort of the, I mean, you have the book, so you yep. know, you know, but for those that don't, the, the book, um, 
follows um the book is called inside a marathon and it's looking at uh scott training for the new york city marathon yeah so the 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 format is he shares his log at the beginning of each chapter so you see exactly what he did each day and he has just really quick short notes like anybody would in their log and then i write a recap of the week and then he writes a recap of the week and those recaps happened in real time uh, during July, August, September, leading October, leading up to New York City, uh, but we never saw each other's. So it's r- it's very real, right. uh, and it's very raw because the whole idea was, hey, we're just going to write what we're thinking. We're not trying to write a story. The story is going to tell itself right. over the course of the book. We're just telling you what we what we're thinking in this moment. And there's high moments, and there's low, and there's uh, dicey moments where we're not sure yep. uh, how things are going. Um, but that's what creates the story. Cool. Um, so you mentioned Steph Bruce. Uh, I saw her race at um, the uh, Reggie Lewis Center in Boston a couple weeks ago, and it was her first. It was her first five k on the track, right? Indoors, yes. Yeah. So um, one of the things she was talking about there was just getting out of the comfort zone. So how how do you think that the how can the average um, you know what's your tip for the average runner or you know the the blue collar runner the desk job runner. Um, how does that person get outside their own comfort zone? Well, I got a good one for this. Uh, it, it, nobody's asked me this in a while. This is a good. This is a, because my answer might be different than it maybe it used to be. Um, you know what we found lately on our team that I think would apply to anyone is let's not be afraid to race. Yep. You know, let's not be afraid to race and let's stop making all our goals about time. Yep. It's just so ridiculous. I mean, it it it's. It sets you up for failure, and I don't mean to be saying that I want to take it easy on you and right. give you an easy way out. I, I think a braver goal is to enter a race like Steph did at Boston that maybe isn't your favorite distance or in the past hasn't been your best distance, right. and just dig down deep yeah. and have your goal be to leave it all out there and then and then see what the time is. You might surprise yourself, yeah. but I would I, w- I would really suggest entering uh, a couple races that are out of your comfort zone and making the sole goal be to take a chance, take a risk, and leave knowing that you ran as hard as you possibly could on the day. That's cool. That's when you feel good about yourself. Yeah, and five Ks are a great medium for that. <laughs> great, absolutely. There's a five K every weekend in every yeah. town, you know. So five um, Ks are great. And yeah. if you screw up, you can fix it the next Do time. It again the next time. And you yeah. learn, you know. And and, and some of those mistakes, uh, or or perhaps um, uh, successes, can can then be applied to whatever your best distance is or whatever your favorite distance is. And, you know, for Steph at Boston, she once again confirmed that, hey, no matter what, she can bring it at the end, you know. And then the next week, sure enough, she brought it at the end at U.S. Cross Country and made the World Cross Country team. So um, I think it was great that she did that race. For sure. One of the things that I've found super beneficial is racing a lot of 5Ks and just getting in in training for something longer but not, you know, close to the goal race um it just gives you that that you know muscle memory of this is race day this is race day this is race day and if you screw up so what whereas with the marathon you know if you screw up there's some recovery involved but um i just raced a 5k uh on sunday and i was i was saying to a friend um it's amazing i was more sore from the 5k than i was after the 50k yeah but it was gone two days later yeah it's still in the legs but you don't feel it as as significantly, and I think that's the cool thing about you can just hammer and find that yeah. find that next gear in in something short like that or short compared to a marathon or something like that. Um, that it's just it's a different feeling when you're just gas pedal down the whole way. I agree with you 100. percent We um, we had a couple of the athletes that ran cross country run a 5k time trial on the road the week before and it seemed to really help yeah. um the next week Fauble ran i think 1408 and we were at like 3100 feet or so um the week before cross and i think it really helped him that's yeah. awesome um so what's what's the day to day of of an elite athlete i know a lot of of the people that i <laughs> i expect will be listening to this are not uh, some of them are going to be high end athletes, but the majority are, you know, people like myself that have, have a full time job and they're always curious, you know, what is, what does it look like at, at the highest level? Well, there, it's just, I think what would surprise people is the amount of time that they're working on themselves 
beyond the actual run. Right. You know, so yes, they're getting up in the morning and they're running 10 miles and then they're going out again and they're running four to six miles in the afternoon. But in between, uh, well, even before they run, they're, they're activating their, um, you know, each, each athlete has their own little issues, you know, so they're activating their glutes or they're warming up their Achilles or their calves or whatever their little trouble spot is. They're doing the run. They're coming back. Oftentimes, they're making a very nice breakfast, very healthy. Obviously, nutrition, huge part of it. But then they're taking a nap, which sounds great, but they don't always want to take a nap. But you have to, you know, because they're training at such a high level. Or they're going to get a massage, or they're going to get dry needling done, or they're going to see their chiropractor, um, or they're getting a blood test. There's just so many things, and their day fills up a lot quicker than I think people would think. Uh, I think people maybe think that they're just sitting around and, and relaxing and watching TV all day, but they're they're usually uh, spending quite a bit of time working on their body. Um, and, you know, then they're they're doing that afternoon run, they're doing some more body work, and they're eating a healthy dinner, and they're going to bed. Yep. So they're making sacrifices each and every night uh, because they're not um, – I don't know what it is people are doing, playing video games or, or watching uh, garbage shows or, um, you know, hanging out with their friends or whatever it might be, going to the bar. Uh, they're just not doing those things. They're going to bed and they're getting up and they're doing it all over again. So it's the monotony, I think, over time that's the big challenge. Yeah. So how do you, how do you get, how do you help them understand the importance of sleep? Because I think that's a takeaway that, that an athlete at any level can, can appreciate and, and benefit from. Look, I mean, I don't, um, I don't overcoach, you know, I don't, I don't, uh, try to uh, be a part of every piece of their lives. Um, I tell them how important it is. And I think over time, especially for the young athletes, they see the success that the older athletes are having and they mimic, they mimic what they're doing and what they're doing is getting their sleep, you know? Um, so mostly I would say, it's anecdotal. Mm -hmm. You know, they look at the best people on the team so and what work. they're doing and it works and, and they follow suit. So how has the team evolved over the time, over the last couple of years? I know you've had some, some consistency and some new athletes and some, um, you know, come and go. How, what's, what's the sort of culture and how's it, how's it improved over the last couple of years? Well, our core has remained the same, you know, for a long time. I mean, we're very proud that Scott Smith, Kellen Taylor, Steph Bruce, Ben Bruce, they've been here since the very beginning, mm -hmm. you know, um, and that, that really means a lot to me. Um, uh, you know, Scott Falwell has been here now since 2015. So the, so the core is very, very strong. Um, you're right to say that, that there's been a little turnover, um, of, of late, uh, you know, people coming and going. And now we have this group that I just love. And I think the word you used is culture. And we use that word a lot. The culture has evolved very organically over the last couple of years. And we've kind of, figured out who works best in this program mm -hmm. you know and it's not my program it's our program right. you know um and there's certain things that are going to work here you know um we're we're a team that's what we believe in that's what works best for us so um people who really crave that team atmosphere that um camaraderie that every day meeting up and and hanging out on the run and talking and joking around that person uh is going to be a fit um people who um, really and truly uh, respect one another and root for one another on a team, that's going to be a fit. Um, we've also kind of, our culture has evolved, and I touched on it a second ago, but we're really about competing. You know, we want to compete. Uh, give us a cross country meet where we can just battle. Right. That's what we want. You know, get, get, put us on the line at the Boston marathon or the New York city marathon. Um, are we necessarily going to have one of the top 10 times in the world for the, at the end of the year? No, but we can be in the top 10 at New York. We can be in the top 10 at Boston and we have consistently, mm -hmm. um, at London as well. Um, so that's what we like. We like competing on the biggest stages. And so the athletes that seem to step up and run their best on the biggest stages, th those people seem to be a fit for us. Um, so it's just, it's all, um, it's all happened over these last couple of years. And I think now we have a really good feel for who, who works. That's awesome. Um, one of the things we were talking about earlier was, uh, the passion that you have for the, the in-person style coaching, um, you have a hard job. It's keeping, you know, a dozen plus people, um, energized, engaged and, and performing at, at their peak. And, um, 
you guys have shared that it's not, you know, it's all, it's not perfect all the time. So what, what is it about the coaching that, that gets you up every morning? Well, I, I enjoy a lot of aspects of it. Um, I just like what I'm doing. You know, it's hard to explain except to say that I really believe in that, that team, that sort of that we culture, you know, we're doing this yep. together and I really feel it. You know, um, I was telling you that I feel quite low these last couple mm-hmm. of days because Saturday was such a high and you got to remember that for me, we had seven athletes racing there. So I feel like I ran seven races, right. you know, cause emotionally I did, you know? And, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I just, I just look, you know, I haven't been the right coach for everyone you know, that's come through here. No way. But, but for the ones that work and for the ones who I'm a good fit for them and they're a good fit for me, man, it really works, you know, because I'll really care. Um, but I'm a human being, you know, if, 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 if part of that coach athlete thing isn't working, you know, um, then I, I, I lose a little bit of faith, you know, and then the athlete loses faith in me and then the whole thing crumbles, you know, but when it's, when it's working, cause I'm a very self-confident person. And if the athlete is very self-confident, then we're almost there. Right. Then if they believe in me, man, I'll believe in them in return. Like no one has ever believed in them in their lives, you know? And, and, um, I think, or I hope that they can feel that. Yep. And, um, that is one of the things that, uh, I think has helped us, um, be successful. Totally. Um, one of the things we were talking about earlier was the, um, that sort of passion and, and, the we were talking about my own coach, David, and how he brings that intensity to every single person he coaches. And I think he has, you know, 200 athletes and, and it's amazing the, um, on the athlete side. And obviously I'm not at the the same level, but I still have goals. I still have, you know, at, at any level, we, we look to get the best out of our own body and to have someone that is responsible for putting a plan in place to help you get there when they're fully bought in and they're fully invested in, in your success there's nothing better. And, you know, they're the biggest cheerleader and they're keeping you in line and there's no, you know, no better feeling than that. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I've been fortunate to have that before. And so I know what you're saying and, and I feel that sense of responsibility and I know, um, I know what it feels like to be told by your coach, someone you respect that you did a great job, yep. you know? Uh, but it's also hard because I can't, I can't say that unless they really did right. because uh, that's a challenge as well because you can't be the boy who cried wolf as a right. coach, you know, you have to, it's not good all the time. Yeah. No, it's not, you know, and you gotta, you gotta be honest with them, but you gain respect that way, right. you know, and, and you gain their trust. And then when you tell them that they're really fit and they're ready to go, they're going to believe, believe you it, because yeah. you also told them when, when you, when they did something <laughs> stupid, you right. know? So yeah, that's, that's coaching, you know, it's a challenge and you just, you have to remember that. Um, okay. I'll tell, I'll tell a story. So, Kevin Hansen, my old coach, tells this story because he coached high school girls for a long, long time in addition to coaching these professional athletes. And uh, <clears throat> his high school girls finished last at the state meet one year. And they drove all the way home in silence for two hours. And he dropped every athlete off, you know, <laughs> one at a time. And the last athlete he dropped off was one of the leaders on the team. And she opened the door and she got out. And then she said, the least you could have done was yelled at us. And then she slammed the door. <laughs> And it was such a big moment for him, a learning moment for him, and he passed it along to us, um, letting us know that, hey, I'm going to tell you, you know, when you screwed up. Yep. And um, that's that's hard, you know, it's hard. But um, I think it shows that you care, you know, it shows that you care. And so, to your point, when you know the when you know the coach cares, um, you're you're much more likely to believe in him or her. Definitely. Switching gears completely. Um, what do you guys do for balance? So, you know, is it is it running all the time, or you know, are there are there hobbies that the athletes have that that you know keep them engaged elsewhere? Well, I certainly encourage them to have balance in their lives. I just speaking of people that just for whatever reason um, seem to not work with our group or with any group, you know. Um, it, it, if running it really and truly is your whole life, I think you're in trouble. I honestly think you're in trouble because you'll be too down 
uh, when things go wrong, or if you're injured, yeah, you can't, you can't, uh, you can't function as a human being, you mm-hmm. know, and that's not good. Um, I think, like any job, what you want to be able to do is leave it at the workplace, mm-hmm. you know. Um, so, if you can have a hard workout, good or bad, and come home and be no worse for the wear, and go. <laughs> I don't know. There's so many athletes on our team that have so many different side projects, but the Bruce's have so many side projects. Steph and Ben, you know, they have their coaching business. They have their camps that they put on. Um, Steph has her um, social media that she keeps on, uh, keeps up with every single day. Um, let's see. Grayson Murphy just wrote, uh, just made this very, very nice uh, planner. Um, Scott wrote his book. A lot of those things have running involved in them, but, Regardless, they're side projects. Mm-hmm. You know, Kellen studied to be a firefighter, is ready to be a firefighter, um, has all her credentials. Um, those kind of things are important. And it's not its not a coincidence, I don't think, that those are some of the people that have been here the longest and are, have had the most success mm-hmm. because they can separate uh, running and life and realize that there's more to this whole thing. Definitely. I've noticed a lot of athletes um, at the top level getting into business um, while they're you know, while, while they're competing, what do you, what do you think about that? Um, I don't want to call it a trend, but what do you think about that? Well, I think athletes, you know, there's plenty of data at the collegiate level that the student athletes have a higher GPA than the rest of the student right. body. Um, there are plenty of examples across all sports of, of athletes being very successful in business post, um, career, post athletic career. That is, um, I think it's because they learn how to work hard. You know, they learn that A plus B equals C. Right. If and you, you fail, if you, it, well, yeah, yeah. They, no, they learn, they learn success, they learn yeah. failure, they learn all of it. But it's, it's a lot more real, like real life than people make it out to be. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you, you learn that if you really work hard at something, um, you will see success eventually. <laughs> to your point, you may fail along the way, but you will see it eventually. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think, but, but I'll say this though, you know, Business is harder, though. I mean, in my opinion, um, I didn't know what real. I thought I worked hard running 120 miles a week for however many straight years, right. but I didn't know what hard work was until I owned a business. Because, I mean, that just brings a whole nother level of pressure that you never had before. Uh, you know, people's livelihoods are on the line. Right. That you're, that, you know, your employees and uh, your livelihood is on the line, and you've got you know bills that are. <laughs> tens of thousands of dollars due at the end of every month that that's a pressure that I had never felt before in running. Um, so I don't want to make it sound like it's easy. I think they, I would say this athletes have the tools to succeed in business, but they don't have the secret sauce. There, there's still a level of pressure that's different in business. Um, so my hope is that athletes can get a little taste of it during their career, Mm -hmm. like we're talking about so that they have a little bit of knowledge as opposed to only focusing on their athletic career and then transitioning straight into business. That's going to be a heck of a transition. So I think a little bit of dabbling during their career is best. Do you have any of the athletes, um, are any of them like taking classes or things like that, um, on a regular basis? Well, Kellen went to, had to take a lot of classes to get her firefighter, Mm -hmm. um, certificate, uh, certification. Um, Grayson is working part time, um, in her field, which is engineering for, uh, sort of a startup company. Um, I'm trying to think if anybody's actually taking any classes right now. I don't know that anybody's taking a college class, but um, we have had athletes in the past. Amy Van Alstein, who was on our team for a number of years, um, took classes during during that uh, time. So it's happened before. I don't know if anybody is right now. Cool. Um, what would what would you have told you know the Ben of of the 120 mile weeks, knowing what you know now? Uh, looking, looking back and, and having the experience you have now and working with athletes, what can you, what would you tell that? What would you tell that guy? You know, I got to experience this a little bit, but I would tell him to live in a little bit more of reality. You know, I think that it's tough because you want to see yourself as a professional. Um, 
But let's be honest, you know, I was a 218 marathoner. You know, I was making a little bit of money here and there, but it really wasn't my livelihood. You know, I was working at the stores. That was my livelihood. If I had been living off my prize money, I would have been on the streets, right. you know? And I think when I owned the stores, I kept running for a couple of years more just for fun, but I actually competed better because I stepped on the line like having a better perspective on right. life in general, you know, and I wasn't, wasn't the only thing. Yeah, yeah, I wasn't putting this bizarre self I, I was my self-worth was no longer connected to my running. Right. And if I could tell that to 23-year-old Ben that hey, your self-worth is not tied to this. Mm -hmm. I think that, that would have been freeing. Yeah. You know, I think at the time if you'd have told me that I'd have said, "No, I need to I need to feel this way because right. that's that's what gets me going, but I think it's totally wrong." You know, so that would be my answer. D stop tying your self-worth to your running, and that would be my suggestion to a lot of people. Yeah. A lot of people. So my my coach and his wife wrote a book as well, and that was one of the big themes that, you know, you are not your yeah, the numbers, whether it's the numbers on a scale or the numbers on a on a um, you know, on the time clock, that 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 is you don't you don't train you don't train for that. You train for the joy of it. You train for the you know the the experience, the journey, all that good stuff. I think so. I think so. And and I think that it, it's a real problem for high level athletes because they've put these goals out there in their own mind and it's great to have goals but you know look at the end of the day if you did everything you possibly could and you ran as hard as you possibly could and your time was x but you wanted to be x minus a minute right and you're devastated man i feel bad for you yeah. i feel bad for you because you you're you're tying your entire self-worth to a time that's totally arbitrary. arbitrary. Yeah. Because let me tell you this. Think about this for a high-level athlete. Let's use a – I don't know. Let's let's use a – we'll use a miler since I don't coach milers. That way I'm not – I'm, not, uh, <laughs> I'm, not, picking on I'm, not, I'm <laughs> not picking on anyone. Let's say that you want to break the four-minute mile. Uh, but you were a 428 guy in high school, okay? And you go through your college career and you bust your butt and you get down to 402 and then you decide I'm going to keep going and you know, you're, 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 you're working your tail off. You got a little job during the day and you're making ends meet and you're, you're busting your butt and you get down to 401 and then you get down to four flat point two in a race that you, you absolutely left it all out there. You were collapsed on the track after. Are you a failure? I just don't believe that, right. you know? Uh, I believe you're an example for people, you know, and if you break your leg the next day and never get to break four, I, I don't think you failed, you know? So how do you balance that uh, with, you know, the love of running, the love of the process with the fact that these are professional athletes that, you know, there's a, there's corporate backing. There's, you know, Hoka is, has invested a serious amount of money in the team and, and they don't do it just because, you know, they're a bunch of good people. Um, how do you, how do you balance the, the joy and the process with, um, continuing to have good results? Because the results will come that, that, that's what I've found. Mm -hmm. if, if you, if you are dedicated to the process and you are doing everything you can to get the most out of yourself and you figure out how to perform your best on race day and you get rid of your demons and, and you, you figure out how to, um, how to perform on the biggest stages, the results will be there. You know, that's what I found. Um, so that's how I, that's how I balance it because I just, uh, last year at our big team meeting at the beginning of the year, so about a year ago now, I just said, look, we're not going to talk about goals this time around. I know you guys have goals. I know you have them. You know, you're the most motivated group of people I've ever been around. Right. Let, let's talk about how to get there. Yeah. You know? Um, and so, I guess, yeah, that's my answer is, at least in my experience over the last year, we had our best year ever in 2018 by far. Amazing results, top 10s at London, Boston, New York, um, you know, amazing, top 224 in the marathon on the women's side, um, 110 half marathons on the female side, uh, everything you could think of. And, uh, and we never talked about any of those times. There That's was awesome. ne there was never a goal setting session where we wrote times on a chalkboard. We never did that. Uh, even 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 the day before the grandma's marathon, when Kellen ran two twenty four, we never talked about the f final time. We just talked about hey, let's let's try to run around five thirty to five forty, stay in that range. Uh, I think that's what you can do, and that's what she did. 
That's awesome. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Uh, I believe I, in you. You can do it. Yeah, let's yeah. Go. Let's go. You know, it wasn't a big, long conversation. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the talk I had with Fauble before the cross champs lasted about two minutes, you know? We're going to go to the... burrito at the end of it. <laughs> <laughs> Run fast. <laughs> exactly, exactly. We're gonna, no, we're just we're going to go to the front, you know? And yeah. We're going to push as hard as we can the whole time. We're going to just keep the pedal down. So, and that ended up being sixth place, and that was great. Uh, if we'd have said that it was top five or it was a failure... What a weird thing to say. That's the, yeah. that's out of our control. For sure. One of the things that my coach wrote on my training log after the race on Sunday, I was um, disappointed, I guess, that um, disappointed with the time, but super happy with um, the the output and and how hard I was able to lean into the pain at the yes. end of it. And that's that's what he wanted me to focus on. He wrote he wrote athletes that focus or 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 um, Athletes that focus their self-worth on a time on race day burn out and never last. And that it just resonated with me. It's like, yeah, I need to focus on that, that pain and that, that like, holy shit, that hurt a lot. And it felt real good. Yeah. Yeah. Embracing the pain, uh, welcoming it. Yep. Those are the type of things we talk about. So how, I, I think that's an area that, that the average runner can, can benefit from sort of leaning into that. I don't want to call it the wall, but leaning into that or, or digging into that. Well, um, how do you, how do you experience that? How do you train for that without, you know, leaving it all in practice? Yeah. I mean, I think the vast majority of practice needs to be very controlled. You know, um, you need to ride the line, you know, mm -hmm. so, you know, doing multiple mile repeats at half marathon pace, or, or let's say more like one hour race pace. Um, you know, that's, that's far enough and fast enough that you're, you're feeling it, but you're not over it, you know? Right. So ri riding that line for long periods of time, you begin to callous the body and callous yep. the mind to what it feels like. Um, you know, and then occasionally going to the well, yeah. I mean, it's just a mix, you know, yeah. you gotta, cause, cause if you're going to race properly, one thing I wouldn't want someone to take from the conversation we've been having is that, oh, I'm going to sign up for a 5K and I'm going to go out as hard as I can and <laughs> right. die. Yeah. That's not what we're suggesting right. because that's actually not brave. Right. What's brave is to go out at, at, at the pace that's comfortably uncomfortable. Yeah, comfortably uncomfortable, optimistically realistic, right. you know, um, so that you can get to two miles and then experience that pain and see if you can ride it all the way to the finish. That's brave. Going out so fast that you're just dead and you crawl home, that's not actually brave and you didn't really actually do anything right. because um, you didn't really even get a chance to try to embrace it. You'll give yourself a chance to try to embrace it if you go out at a proper pace and then and then just crush at that two like the hardest part of the race. Yeah. Five K is two such a great yeah. example. Two miles. Oh my gosh, you know. But you just you just lean into it. I love that phrase. Um, we use that a lot. It's it's a great phrase. Yeah, and it feels it feels so good, but so bad. It's the best <laughs> afterward, though. You know, it's the best. Um, I learned I learned that feeling. Um, Again, probably later in my career, and I I do think it had so much to do with just learning that hey, this is the fun part. Yeah, you know this. I thought the fun part was going to be running these times. Yeah, uh, but the fun part was leaning into things. I uh, not that I'm going to talk about my own career because there's nothing compared to these guys. But but the the race that I'm the most proud of is not one when I was with the Hansons. Uh, it was a St. Patrick's Day race in my hometown of St. Louis that was just like the local, you know, bragging rights kind right. of race. Um, when five you're miler. Beer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, kind of thing. But all the all the quote unquote best guys in right. town ran it, you know. And I ran it this one year when I wasn't in shape. I'd been working so hard at the stores. I mean, just ridiculous seventy hour weeks and. Um, and but I wanted to win because the store always won. We always had right. somebody win the race. And I'm telling you, I dug deeper than I've <laughs> ever dug in my life. And I ran like 24:11 for 8k, yeah. which is not terrible, but it's not a lead or anything. But but um, I'm telling you, I felt so good after that because that's the hardest I've ever gone. Yeah, it's the hardest I've ever gone. And you were doing it not just for yourself, but you know, oh, for the store, totally for the store, <laughs> zero for myself. <laughs> yeah. Zero for myself, one hundred percent for the store. I found that that when you're doing something like that, it you can do anything. Like anything is possible when when there's a teammate, when you're doing it for someone else. Yeah. And I love that in in the book, looking at um, 
training or racing Chicago. Yeah. That was super cool. I, I experienced, you know, that myself with the 50 K in the fall. It, it, you know, I, people ask like, did it hurt? I was like, no, I was so high on adrenaline yeah. with the fundraising we were doing and with all the people that were following along that like, I didn't stop to think about the pain once. Yep. And it's that you can't, you can't train that. And yeah. it's just, you need, whether it's finding that source of motivation, but it's out there yeah. for sure. That's cool. Well, awesome. Um, like I said, I don't want to take up the rest of your day. I love the, <laughs> love the on the moment, uh, podcast here and and want to thank you for uh, for taking the time to do so thanks man this was great of course okay awesome see you that's it for today's episode like many long runs it's sad when it has to end i hope you join in next week on for the long run and in the meantime happy trails if you've enjoyed this episode it would mean a lot to me if you shared it so that others can find it and enjoy it too